I want to talk to you about what it means to be the challenger. And I want to begin with some conventional wisdom from James Baldwin, who was famous for saying, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter, even by a millimeter, the way people look at reality, then you can change it. Right now, what DeSantis and Young, Youngkin and others have done is alter the way that people are thinking about our reality, that somehow diversity, equity, and inclusion are a bad thing, that somehow talking about our history undermines the fabric of democracy, when in fact, that's always which is what has propelled democracy forward. In fact, one of the things that I love about Baldwin in particular, and we think about this in terms of the civil rights movement, is this idea that in the shadow of this moment, as Baldwin argued, and there we go, yeah. the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he or she is being educated. And see, when you begin to examine a society in which you become educated, you begin to ask questions about why certain things are the way they are. Pastor Williams spoke to that when he talked about growing up here and asking questions about why do they assign that book in class and, and, and why are people able to use such hateful language and why won't somebody do something about gun violence in our country? And why are people so hateful toward women of color? I mean, the reality is that we pretend that young people aren't watching what's happening every day and asking the question in a meaningful way, where are the adults in this conversation? And then we take away from our critical first responders in that space, teachers, the opportunity to help students navigate these important questions. We act like students didn't witness the murder of George Floyd and have questions about what that moment meant. We act like students here in Florida in particular wouldn't have connected that to Trayvon Martin and Black Lives Matter. We act like they didn't witness what happened at Mother Emanuel and ask questions collectively about why is it that Black lives don't seem to matter and no one seems to be addressing it. As Pastor said, we are, or as Wilmer said, sleeping through it. They're also asking questions, and we saw this when we don't tackle our history, honestly. I remember in, in, in 2000, everybody was worried about Y2K and the digital divide, right? We thought the world was going to end. Uh, in 1999, we thought Prince called it, right? And the reality is that it took the 2020 for people to realize the digital divide was real when students of color found themselves on the outs not having access to technology in a moment when the pandemic forced all of us home. When the social determinants of health made real in that moment, those deep divisions that racial injustice and structural inequality continue to perpetuate in our society. See, that's what Baldwin's talking about. Young people are watching. Now, the reality is when we think about this, I'm tired of people talking about this being a woke agenda. Let me define woke for you. This is what woke looks like for uh, parents of black children. That's all woke means. We can't sleep because we fear for the very lives of young people. But I also wanna be clear that it's not just fearing for our children's lives, it's fearing for this democracy, which while imperfect in the way the pastor talked about is our best hope for justice. And we've fought and died on that principle. What I think is so important about this is that when people talk about this, they love to whitewash the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. They want to whitewash our history. This is a great two political uh, cartoons here I want to share with you. One shows, you know, the, the white elephant in the room, the big lie. It's why people love books like James Lowen's Lies My Teacher Taught Me, right? Because our history has been based on mythology, which we continue to perpetuate in the same way that we talked about the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. I'm George Washington. I cannot tell a lie, but I can own a slave. But then at the same time, we take somebody like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who was not perfect, and we take a man who wrote three books and, and delivered hundreds of sermons and wrote dozens of articles, and we reduce him to his I have a dream speech. And like this cartoon, we come out with these platitudes, particularly people like Governor Youngkin in Virginia. Sir, didn't Martin Luther King say that it all came down to simple equality? I would suggest you read the entire speech because it was far more complex than that. In fact, when we talk about this history, I want to go back with you for just a minute. February 28, 1994, Virginia. When people were upset that they were going to get rid of the state song, Carry me back to old Virginia. 
I want to read this advertisement to you from 1994. Help us fight political correctness and preserve our Southern heritage. Some individuals claim that our state song is racist. Because it is. Because it was. Don't they know that the state song was written in 1870 by a black Virginian about a former slave who loved and missed his former masters? Don't they know that to make money in this country, you got to appeal to the masses? And so therefore you put out things that reify people's ideals about what they are, even if they don't even remotely match up to the reality? This song, they continued, is part of Virginia's history and heritage, our heritage, black and white. No, you mean what Wilmer and Pastor were talking about, the heritage you decided was going to enter into the curriculum. This, the song that you decided would reflect the heritage of the state that we didn't get a vote in, that our lives weren't reflected in. And I love the last part of this. The Virginia Assembly is trying to quietly pass this bill without allowing Virginia voters a chance to voice their opinion. And at the end, it says, what will they change next? Will they rewrite the lyrics to Dixie? Will they remove our Confederate monuments? Will they erase Lee and Jackson from Lee Jackson King Day? Yeah. Yeah. Last time I checked, Lee and Jackson fomented a revolution against the United States and attempted to secede from the Union. I don't know in any other society that we reify the losers in an effort to undermine democracy. And so when I read the Virginia executive order, and I, I, I would ask everyone tonight, everyone in my hearing, please read the Virginia executive order, because it's comical. First and foremost, they do that typical reference in Dr. King. So only then will we realize Dr. Martin Luther King's dream that our children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's what they say in the bill. But I want to read just section 13 to you. The superintendent of public instruction will initiate through the regular curriculum reevaluation process changes that ensure Virginia students are given thorough and comprehensive education of the world. U.S., United States, and Virginia history without the influence of inherently divisive concepts. Well, what do you mean by divisive concepts? I'm going to read this to you. For the purpose of this executive order, inherently divisive concepts means advancing any ideas in violation of title for Title V of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, including but not limited to the following concepts. One's race, skin color, ethnicity, sex, or faith is inherently superior to another race, skin color, ethnicity, sex, or faith. What that means we can't teach the Civil War, and that's what the cornerstone speech that Alexander Stevenson gave in 1861 was all about. That was the very fabric of the Confederacy. That's what George Wallace meant when he said, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Oh, by the way, how's that working out for you? <laughs> we'll read the last part of this for you, because I think this is, this is cute. An individual's moral character is inherently determined by his race or skin color. An individual, by, by virtue of his race or skin color, bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race. This is the foolishness that we're seeing reflected in legislatures by people who are concerned about the teaching of truthful history that doesn't say you're responsible for what happened, but in order to ensure that this doesn't happen again, we have to talk on honestly about what went wrong. The erasure is what produced the wound that produces the narrative. Wounds produce narratives. So when we talk about communities of color, when we talk about the LBGTQ+, when we talk about indigenous people, it's the wound that expressed itself. Not simply a desire to see oneself reflected in the curriculum, but the reality of what it means to live in a society that says, you don't really matter. Except that you do when you actually study the, the history honestly. I want to be clear that, you know, and I'm going to spend some time today talking about some of the people we reify. I'm going to whisper this into the mic for the people at home because I really want you to pay attention. <laughs> you know, Thomas Jefferson is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but in 1779, Jefferson made the case for teaching truthful history. What did Jefferson say? The most effectual means of preventing the perversion of power into tyranny is to illuminate as far as practical in the minds of the people, and more especially to give them knowledge of those facts which history exhibits. Apparently, Yunkin and Abbott and DeSantis don't read, because there it is in black and white. 
What else did Mr. Jefferson say? That possessed thereby the experience of other ages and countries. In other words, not just US history, world history, global history, African diaspora. Ha ha. Little black studies in there, right? Little Latino stuff. Because it's got to be comprehensive. If we need to know tyranny in all its forms, we can't simply understand it in the guise that it might come looking like Vladimir Putin. We have to understand it in the guise it might come looking like somebody who's a little bit more familiar to us. Now, some people will be upset that I talked about Jefferson. They'll be, well, why did you talk about the slaveholder? Because I believe, and Pastor spoke to this, and Wilmer spoke to this, that we can be two things at once, that those contradictions can live not in harmony, but in opposition in a way that builds in us a desire to achieve what Dr. King described as the beloved community, but what we can call a just democracy. See, you wrote those words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, but you didn't apply them to everyone. And for most of our history, the enterprise has been making those words applicable to everyone. And what's powerful about that, at least for me, is that we can take somebody like John Lewis, who never lost hope. Now, if there was anyone, if you look at John Lewis's life, who had a right to not be hopeful when he left the, the planet, it's Congressman John Lewis. He grew up in a world in which segregation was the norm. He's born in 1942 in a world in which literally segregation is the norm. He spills blood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965 in uh, marching for the, the, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which Viola Louiso and And those murders don't take away his passion. He's inspired by Jimmy Lee Jackson. He's inspired by Viola Louiso. He'll go on to work with the Voter Education Project and ultimately become a US congressperson. And then after Trayvon Martin, which we often forget to teach about, at the same time that Trayvon Martin was coming down the pike here in Florida, there was this little case called Shelby County versus Holder, which eviscerated key sections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it was John Lewis who was the first person to come out and say, I say to the Supreme Court, don't undo with a court decision what Johnson signed into law in 1965 because I was there and people shed blood and we don't want to have to go through this process again. And yet, shortly before his death, in the midst of the National Black Lives Matter movement, because John Lewis, who is suffering terribly in his last days, who could have been home spending time with his family, saying, I've given an entire life to public service, decided to write a final letter to the American people entitled, Powerfully, together we can redeem the soul of America. And in it, he articulates what I like to call the Lewis Doctrine. And you'll be surprised or maybe not to find that John Lewis is in conversation with Thomas Jefferson. What does Lewis say? First and foremost, and I need you all to understand this in Florida, in Seattle, in Pittsburgh, in Minneapolis, wherever you're watching, in Chicago, in Montgomery, in Selma, Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Now, I'm going to tell you about people not finishing the whole thing. Everybody quotes the part about good trouble, necessary trouble. They didn't read the first line that said ordinary people with extraordinary vision. And how does one develop extraordinary vision? Reading. Writing. A good pastor. I want you to listen carefully to what Congressman John Lewis said, because he said, voting and participating in the democratic process are key, but then he goes on to say, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it's not guaranteed. You can lose it. But again, people don't read the whole thing. So Governor, I'm gonna read to you today. This is what we call a close read in K-12. We don't do critical race theory, but we do do close reads. Teacher gets down, because my partner is an elementary teacher. She, she, she likes to, and she says, okay, kids, we're going to analyze this. You must also study and learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this soul-wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. So if you got up this morning and thought that it was solved with the civil rights movement, you forgot that all of us are drafted in the constant struggle to preserve the fabric of what we imagine to be 
a just democracy. And we have a duty and responsibility every day to get up and reimagine based on our experience in that moment. Don't lose me here. John Lewis goes one step further. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. I just want to point out here, John Lewis and, and Thomas Jefferson are in conversation. Centuries apart, different men, different background, different experience. And oh, by the way, Governor, Virginia and Florida and every place else and everybody else who's watching this and waiting to go, or CRT. This is the other CRT, critical thinking. This is what happens when you read and you can make connections over time. John Lewis concludes, I don't want to be clear, the truth does not change and the answers that worked out long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our own time. In other words, the reason why they're working so diligently to hide what's in those books is because the truth is in those books. And that truth should bring us together. In fact, I want to uh, put it this way. I talked about the Lewis Doctrine, but I want to go one step further. Thurgood Marshall in the aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education said something very important. We're here on the anniversary of Brown. But the year after Brown, right? Several years after Brown, 1957, 58, September 58, Thurgood Marshall saying, you know what? People kind of miss the point here because education is not the teaching of the three R's. It ain't about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Education, he wrote, is the teaching of overall citizenship, to learn to live together with fellow citizens, and above all, to learn to obey the law. Follow me here. Marshall continues, I do not know of any more horrible destruction of the principle of citizenship than to tell young children in Little Rock that those of you who withdrew rather than go to school with black kids, come back, all is forgiven, you win. Therefore, I'm not worried about black children in these states. I worry about white children in Little Rock who are told as young people that the way to get your rights is to violate the law and defy lawful authorities. I'm worried about their future. I don't worry about the black kids' future. They've been struggling with democracy long enough. They know about it. Allow me to draw a parallel. I don't know of any more horrible destruction to the principle of citizenship to tell young children that those of you who went to the Capitol and burned what Nancy Pelosi called the temple of democracy, tried to tear it down, come back, all is forgiven. Ha ha. I don't worry about the black kids. They've been struggling with democracy long enough. I worry about the white kids that took that lesson in. And then governors, you want a curriculum that says, yeah, it didn't happen. I know I'm running out of time, but I had tech issues, so I'm taking my extra time. I want to be clear with all of you. Thank you, Orlando. I got one person here that loves me. I want to be very clear that when I say young people are watching, I want you to go back to Melba Batilla Beals, the youngest of the Little Rock Nine. Her mama says to her, baby, keep a diary because you're living through history. See, literacy isn't, as Pastor pointed out, only what happens in school. It's what happens in the home when parents take the initiative and say, if you're going to be part of a participatory democracy, then you need to take your responsibilities and duties seriously early on. And that's what Melba's mama was doing. She said, baby, and I wish people would tell young people now, you're living through history, Black Lives Matter. You're living through history, Me Too. You're living through history, a global pandemic. Your thoughts matter. One day what you write may very well be the document which future historians use to construct the model of the past that will illuminate for people what steps need to be taken to make sure we never make those mistakes again. Books like The Diary of Anne Frank and like Melba Patilla Beale's Warriors Don't Cry. But I want to read this to you because people pretend young people don't know what's going on. She kept that diary, became the foundation for this book, and she wrote in that. I want to read this to you out of the mouth of children. How strange I thought to be involved in something the whole nation considers its 10 most important stories. If it's that important, you think somebody would do something to make the central high students behave themselves. Is it that nobody cares? or nobody knows what to do. Such generosity, but I imagine today, there are young students in Florida and in Virginia and in Ohio and in Pennsylvania asking the same question. Is it that nobody cares? 
or nobody knows what to do. But they're getting the answer back because they're seeing legislation after legislation coming out saying, we know what to do, hide the history, which should signal to all of us. We, we, my, my, my grandmother used to say this all the time. If people want to hide something for you, they put it in a book. So we should be picking up them books. Don't lose me here. I, I'm running out of time. I want to conclude with you today on this note. I just, because I, I, I got to talk about this. Because we look at those images from January 6th. And to me, for all the world, that looks a lot like Little Rock in 1957. <laughs> but I also want to say, and I want to be clear, because people say, well, you know, this is critical race theory. I want to point out, I've only talked about two African-Americans at this point. But I talked about a whole bunch of conservatives. Ha ha. And the one I want to talk about with you now is Sandra Day O'Connor. What I love about Sandra Day O'Connor is that Sandra Day O'Connor was famous for saying, the practice of democracy is not transferred through the gene pool. It must be taught and learned anew by each generation of citizens. So I want to say this again real slow. Democracy is a practice. What do you mean by that? Now, all of a sudden, some people in the back said the Sixers lost and Dr. Williams is channeling Allen Ivers. We in here talking about practice. But I want to be clear because I teach in a law school when I tell my first year law students, you don't perfect law, you practice law. I've had four heart procedures in the last three years. I'll tell you right now, doctors don't perfect medicine, they practice medicine. Practice means that you're not always going to get it right, but you have the hope and determination and the will to believe that if you get the right combination correct and you don't give up in the way the pastor talked about, you got to keep trying. And you have to understand it again, it's not transferred through the gene pool that every generation must take on the responsibility of building that muscle by educating itself. And so therefore anyone who seeks to deny them the opportunity to do that is not simply anti-intellectual, they're undemocratic. Now look, I gotta do this. When we don't study our history, we wind up with moments like our contemporary moment where we think everything is new. You got people running around talking about our environmental crisis, structural racism. Play this game with me for just a second. I wanna read to you from, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, the final report of the National Commission on the Causes of Prevention of Violence from 1960. I wanna be very clear. We solved the violence problem in 1960. Because that's the final report, right? Our most serious challenges to date have been external, the kind this strong and resourceful country could unite against. While serious external dangers remain, the graver threats today are internal. Haphazard urbanization. Sound familiar, same feet? <laughs> Racial discrimination. <laughs> Disfiguring of the environment. Somebody tell Greta, not new. Unprecedented interdependence. People read that, they go, but, but I don't know what that means, Dr. Williams. What that means is that these little computers that we walk around called cell phones mean that we're dependent in a way, follow me here, in ways that we didn't anticipate in 1960 that have become a reality today. Last one, and the dislocation of human identity. People go, what do you mean by that? Well, allow me to share you what I mean by singing a song from you from a TV show that came out in the 1970s called All in the Family. Dislocation of human identity. Boy, the way Glenn Miller played songs that made the hit parade. Guys like us, we had it made. Those were the days. And you knew who you were then. Girls were girls and men were men. I want to be very clear that Norman Lear in 1970 turned a comedy, turned American bigotry into a comedy. And I want to be clear that Norman Lear did something that was brilliant in that moment because he didn't put America's most lovable racist in Birmingham. He didn't put America's most lovable racist in Tallahassee. He didn't put him in Montgomery. He put him in Queens, New York, where Donald Trump's daddy was denying people of color access to homes. I want to end with you on this note. People will say, some of you watching, because we got material, Dr. Scott and I did NPR today, and people were on, it would be nice if the professor shared both sides. I'm tired of this CRT. 
This ain't CRT, my friends. This is simply what the National Council for Social Studies calls core democratic values for elementary students. Now I got to read a couple of, because the National Council for Social Studies says, these are things that every elementary student should know. I'm going to read four of them for you. Life, each citizen has the right to the protection of their life. Ha ha. Liberty includes freedom to believe what you want, freedom to choose your own friends, justice, all people should be treated fairly. Popular sovereignty, the power of government comes. True, the government and citizens should not lie somewhere. But I want to end with you on this note. We can't run from our history because when we do, those values become meaningless. And I'll end with you on this note. You know, last year, they were going to have a professional development here in Florida. And you're going to meet the professor who was at the center of that, Michael Butler, tomorrow. He's going to be here to talk. But I want to tell you how I, I, I got involved. The organization that was putting that on said, Dr. Williams, uh, we were going to have this professional development and it's gone sideways because the teacher who was involved wanted to include two images, an image of nonviolent protests from the 1960s, the sit-ins, and an image of Colin Kaepernick. And school officials saw that and they said, you got to take that out, that CRT. And so Professor Butler said, we're not, what? No, we're not changing anything. We're not going to do it. And so they said, the teacher has to go. And Professor Butler said, I will not participate. And so then Yohuru got a call. Dr. Williams, can you come down to Florida? And to, I said, well, okay, let, let, let me hear you out. What is the seminar? Civil rights movement. That's my specialty. <laughs> what do you want me to talk about? Civil rights? I said, but then you guys just have a situation where you canceled it because somebody put up two images, one a nonviolent protest. Yeah, we did. But I don't think I could come then because that's what I do. No, 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 Dr. Williams, we want you to come. Please come, please come, please come, please come. I said, okay, fine. I'll come. I got three rules. Number one, no pre-censorship of my materials. We can't do that. Don't think I can come. Okay, no pre-censorship. <laughs> Number two, I get the whole afternoon to myself. You want the whole time by yourself? No cooperating teacher, no learning specialist? The whole time. We don't think we could do that. I don't think I could come. You got the whole day, Dr. Williams. <laughs> Nine to three. <laughs> Number three, I fly first class. Guess which one I didn't get? I want to be clear. <laughs> you know, lost my PowerPoint here, unfortunately. I want to be clear. I'm showing you an image here. Unfortunately, you can't see it. I went down there, and what I shared with them was an image of the Challenger disaster. Because I was actually in Florida on the anniversary of the Challenger disaster. And what ended up happening is I walked in the room. And I think I, I freaked the teachers out because everybody's like, what is he talking about? We thought this was supposed to be about civil rights. What is this clown talking about, right? I said, relax. I know what I'm doing. Everybody relax. Just, just relax. So I got to go on and I said to uh, the folks that were there, I want you to take a look at this image of Challenger for just a second of that crew. Oh, I lost it again. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Can you, you, it'll probably come up in a second. Um, I said, I want you to take a look at, and for those of you that are home, you can simply Google an image of the Challenger crew from 1986. What you'll see in that Challenger crew are Ronald McNair, African-American. What you'll see is Ellison Onizuka, first Japanese-American in space. What you'll see is Krista McAuliffe. I love this about the Reagan administration. People get, get mad at me, but again, if for people go at CRT and you don't talk about no conservatives, I've talked about a lot of conservatives tonight. Ronald Reagan, the Reagan administration, to their credit, said, because you had all kinds of people arguing that they should be go to space. Uh, you know, John Glenn wanted to go back. Entertainers wanted to go back. Actors wanted to go back. Musicians wanted to go. They said, we want to democratize access. We want a teacher to be the first civilian in space. I love that. You also had another woman who was part of that crew that I'm going to talk about in just, just a second. I don't know if this is going to come back up. Anyway, to, to make a long story short, while Charles works on this, and I'm just going to continue to tell you the story. When the Challenger went down, it was a national tragedy. And Ronald Reagan had the unenviable task of addressing the American people about the Challenger tragedy. So he goes on the TV that afternoon. In fact, he says to his speechwriter, Peggy uh, Noonan, we got to address this. We can't pretend this didn't happen because young people are watching. And so that evening, in a moment of statesmanship, 
Because when everybody thinks about the Challenger disaster, they quote this line in the speech, the astronaut slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. It's beautiful, but that ain't the part of the speech that I want to talk with you about tonight. Reagan ends up saying to them, he says, look, I want to say something to the school children of America who are watching the Challenger disaster. I want to say something to them, and I want them to know that sometimes bad things happen. So he's addressing this. I wish some politicians today would be studying Ronald Reagan in that moment. Now, it's hard for me to say that. <laughs> some people here have a sense of humor. Some people in the whole world. I just want to be clear. But Reagan ends up saying to them, I am going to give up on this, and I am just going to share this with you because I'm going to run out of time, and I'm just going to read this to you. Reagan says to them, Ladies and gentlemen, I plan to speak to you tonight on the State of the Union, but the events of earlier today have led me to change those plans. I want to say something to the school children of America who are watching the footage of the space shuttles take off. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew were pulling us into the future and we'll continue to follow them. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. That's the way freedom is, and we wouldn't change it for a minute. Mr. DeSantis, Mr. Young, Youngkin, and other Republicans, allow me to go around with Reagan in response to you. We don't hide our history. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front in public. That's the way democracy is, and I wouldn't change it for a minute. And in conclusion, and technology can't hold us down tonight. When Muhammad Ali passed, Pat Begley did this phenomenal cartoon of Ali. I loved it because people were talking about Ali's legacy. People forgot or forget that Ali gave up three years of his boxing career to speak truth to power, to stand for something, to be willing to, to, to sacrifice for what was right. And what I loved about what Pat Begley did, and I want to say this to all of you this evening, without being able to show you this great picture of the Challenger, right? Because NASA didn't come to that by accident. 1986 ain't that moment in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The reason why NASA did that is they went back to Kennedy's speech at Rice University where Kennedy said, space is going to demand the talents of all of us. He probably knew that. Think about them black women from hidden figures. The sisters that made it happen. Follow me here? Gene Roddenberry, a couple years later in, in, in Star Trek, had the, you know, space, the final frontier. Look at the Enterprise crew from 1966. You got Mr. Sulu, Mr. Chekhov, Lieutenant Uhura, no relation. <laughs> in fact, my man Roddenberry, one month step further, he put an alien. You know, he said, Mr. Spock, just in case. <laughs> NASA pursued that because they recognized they would not have had a successful program without diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mr. Governor, that ain't divisiveness and indoctrination. That's just good planning. Corporate responsibility. Genius. But I conclude with you. Pat Begley said about Ali. Ali wasn't the greatest because he was the champ. Ali was the greatest because he was always the challenger. Allow me to say to you this evening, we need to be the challengers. Be the challenger in standing up for diversity, equity, inclusion. Be the challenger in demanding a curriculum that reflects the experience of all people who make up our community. Push back against this narrative about wokeism and some type of agenda in favor of the idea that when we challenge, we move closer to what John Lewis talked about, closer to Dr. King's beloved community, where it ain't about rhetoric, it's about substance. Thank you. Just one second, Dr. Yuhuru. My goodness, that was fire. Wow. Whoa. So there there are a bunch of young educators who go on learning tours with uh Dr. Terry and David, and they they were kind of live tweeting your whole thing and they were just it was like boop, 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 boop. they're popping off you have them going thank you i appreciate thank you for bringing it 
Um, you kept saying you were ending and you didn't even need to end. <laughs> we could take some more, Dr. Uhuru. In fact, you're going to see some more of him. He has another we'll segment later. Yeah. We'll be here 24 hours. 24 hours. He'll be hosting hours. overnight. He'll be hosting overnight. If if I fall asleep or Terry falls asleep, Yuhuru's going to pop in. So you'll be, you'll be, you'll get some more Yuhuru. How did I just wound up staying up all the you, time? You, <laughs> because, look, you, he earned it tonight. Didn't he earn it? He earned that. You, you're the, that was good. That was definitely Thank you. Thank you for being here with us.